Hi, in this episode, I welcome Sam Glassenberg, who's led his entire career leading companies at the cutting edge of the video game industry. At Level X, his team harnesses video game technology and cognitive neuroscience to train over 1 million medical professionals. Sam was previously CEO of the top independent game publisher in Hollywood, led Microsoft's DirectX graphics team, and created games at LucasArts. He speaks internationally on video games in medicine. Two quick points. Um, one, I had no idea about using this video and putting it on YouTube back when we recorded it, um, but I wanted to share it, but that's why the microphone's in my face, video's blown out, blah, blah, blah. Um, the other part is the reason we're both laughing about Level X and his title in the beginning is because it's kind of silly. I've known Sam for seven and a half years, worked with him for almost seven, but I wanted to keep the show format. So that's what you got. I think you're going to find it really interesting. And please don't forget to like and subscribe. Let's go. Hey, Sam. So what part of the world are you calling in from tonight? Chicago, Illinois. Uh, the suburbs of Chicago, Illinois, okay. specifically. Right. Tell me, what's your current role at Level X? <laughs> I am the CEO and founder of Level X. So thinking back, like, how did you get started in the game industry? Like many things in my career, I got started in the video games industry by accident. <laughs> so um, I studied at University of Illinois for undergrad, uh, right. computer science. I did Great animation. School. I did animation as a hobby. So I was an engineer and my hobby was art. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember I applied for jobs at uh, ILM, uh, like Disney, Pixar. I wanted to work in feature film. Right. And I ended up getting an offer from Lucasfilm, not in the film division, but in the games division at LucasArts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was originally wanted to go into film and then I got this offer in, um, in video games and was like, all right, let's try it out. And I quickly learned that the problems that we were dealing with in the video games industry were way more interesting than the problems they were dealing with in feature film. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Well, and you were at Stanford too, right? I mean, uh, in between those two or. Yeah. So I did Lucas, I was at Lucas arts. Then I went to Microsoft. I was doing my master's remotely and then I couldn't handle both things at once. So I swung down to mm. campus for about nine months to finish my master's. Um, okay. and that's when I like joined the direct X graphics team. Right. No, that's cool. So thinking back to that time, like, what do you wish you had known when you started that you know now getting that first job at Lucas? So I, I, I'm very lucky. Like, I learned a lot of these things on the job. And I guess I would mm -hmm. have been nice to have learned them earlier, but I don't regret, like, learning them through experience. I, yeah. I remember, you know, I was I was the only artist. Sorry, I was the only engineer um, mm -hmm. on a team of artists. I was hired as an animator. My job was to literally, like, animate cutscenes for playstation 2 titles this was like before the original xbox came out okay and i was so i'm an engineer by trade but i'm working as an animator and i'm surrounded by artists and what i quickly discovered i was very lucky i was literally dropped into the most talented art team in the games industry almost like lucas arts was second to none so i'm yeah. working incredibly talented people. And I quickly realized that no matter what I do, I'm never going to be as good at art as they are, but I'm an engineer. And so I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm seeing all of these problems that the team is running, these technical problems the team is running into. The artists mm -hmm. are trying to create, they wanted to create a level where you could fly around an asteroid, but the terrain tools didn't work on a sphere and they uh -huh. wanted to shadows and there weren't any tools for doing that back in, I don't know, two, 2001 and but i was an engineer so i sat down and was like oh here i could i could fix that for you i can make that work and i would start making tools and mm -hmm. next thing you know i wasn't doing art anymore uh i had right. transitioned to technical art that's when i discovered you know my role in life was not to be an artist it was right. to make sure that the technologies like the hardware the software didn't get in the way of what more talented artists and designers wanted to achieve that was my calling Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of paved the way for the work I did at Microsoft. Just again, right. just you know, making like DirectX. My job was to build the matrix, figure out how we make video games look real, and you know, build the underlying technology that games use. How we, how did we do that? Well, it was all about figuring out what the most, you know, the talented game developers and designers wanted to create, and make sure that 
the next generation hardware and APIs and tools and everything supported what they wanted mm -hmm. and didn't get in their way. And then it yeah. quickly became less about just making sure the technology doesn't get in the way of what they want to do, but making sure that the business doesn't mm -hmm. get in the way of what they wanted to do. So mm -hmm. I would have, it certainly would have benefited me to learn some of these lessons earlier, but you know, I got to enjoy my time flying spaceships in the meanwhile. Right. Yeah. And for people that don't realize it too, like it was crazy before DirectX, right? I was like, it was like the wild west and like everyone had to write their own drivers and there were different video cards out and it was just painful, you know, and I, and I was there in 96, I think it was 96 oh when they launched it. Yeah. And it was like a big initiative and they hired Guar to play at a party at Microsoft <laughs> in the garage underground and Guar was doing stuff and it was Alex St. James or whatever that guy was. Alex St. John. Um, St. John. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was behind that. And we were there demoing games, showing Viacom games, running DirectX, you know, 1.0 just to try and centralize this stuff. Cause otherwise it was just, you can't get to work with that video card. Just put in the readme, you're screwed. Right. You, you know, and there was just so much effort going into all that stuff that DirectX really helped make it cohesive and centralize it so that it wasn't so wild west. That was the idea. I can't take credit for the early days. So I joined like yeah. in the DirectX nine days. Okay. Um, and so we were doing the, the similar thing. Our goal mm -hmm. was, you know, how do you make it so people can make great games on Windows and Xbox without having to write custom code and create custom content for NVIDIA, Power VR, AM mm -hmm. or ATI, Intel, different chipsets. We right. wanted to make it so like you can make a game once and it looks great. And that lets you work, focus your efforts on making great games, not making the same game work on different hardware. So that's yeah. that's where you're sort of shepherding this multi-billion dollar ecosystem and really trying to, you know, almost it's like like it's it's like I can it's like game theory. You're trying to get everybody around the table to say, look, mm -hmm. instead of fighting over the pie, you know, all right, all you, you know, hardware vendors, instead of trying to fight over the pie by, you know, making your chip have some, you know, special feature that right. you know, only is available to you, why don't we just grow the pie? And make it so mm -hmm. it's easier to make games and easier to take advantage of the GPU on Windows um, right. and on Xbox. And so ultimately, that led to even some of the stuff we're seeing today. Like the reason you're able to do all this crazy, you know, AI stuff on these GPUs is because they've been standardized to be able to, you know, support high precision math and you know mm -hmm. run in under consistent APIs and in a consistent way. Well, right. the early days of DirectX, I can't take credit for that. Those was crazy. Like the original, I think like the original, there was all this nuclear themes with like early mm. DirectX. So yeah. all the logos were like uh, variations of the radiation logo and the annual conference mm. was called Meltdown. Yes. Uh, and all <laughs> yeah, of it yeah. was radiate. In, in fact, the original name for, the code name for DirectX before DirectX launched was the Manhattan Project. And ah. this is terrible. This is very- Whoa. Like, not acceptable. So the reason why yeah. is because in the 90s, who dominated the living room? Yeah. It was the Japanese console makers. It was Sony and Nintendo. Sony and Nintendo. And so yeah. DirectX was Microsoft's strategy to, you know, oh. basically turn the PC into a gaming platform and then use that as our uh entry point into the living room. Mm -hmm. Um I think they definitely went way too far with the Manhattan Project yeah. analogies, though. Yeah, 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 definitely. Well, and then, you know, the Xbox was very PC-like, right? Like, I, I remember going in 2001 when they had the first DevCon out in Seattle at Boot, and I flew out there, and they were just showing all the hardware, and they were super, super helpful, embracing developers, and wanting to make it as easy as you could, whereas Sony was just like, yeah, figure it out, you know, we've got hardware engineers doing stuff that no one can figure out, and it was a very big contrast between, like, supporting developers and people on the platform and Microsoft was wisely very accommodating, right? Cause they were the underdog, you know? So, well, look, I mean, um, but there were plenty of underdogs in the game console business that did not make their yeah. consoles easy to develop for. Uh, yeah, right. the original, I mean, it was originally basically the direct Xbox, but Microsoft, I mean, Microsoft has built developer platforms for decades. Yeah. You know, starting with like Microsoft basic and stuff. So they, they, yeah, yeah. from the get go, have understood the importance of creating a good developer ecosystem and making life mm -hmm. 
easy for developers, not only like technically, but also from a you know creating business opportunity. Yeah, because that's going to feed the machine, and they, they understand that. Yeah, that that's um, the responsibility of platform providers. Like, put yeah. great hardware and great you know infrastructure, network right. you know lot of infrastructure, Support. everything else out yeah. there. So you know, get it into the living rooms, get it onto the desktops, so that. You can create mm -hmm. an opportunity for great game developers to express themselves, create great content, and make money doing it. So what's your advice that you would give someone looking to get their first job now here in 2023? Getting their first job? Yeah, getting their first job, like getting out I mean, of school or doing their thing on the side. Like, you know, what do you portfolio, think? Portfolio, portfolio, portfolio. Yeah. And that goes yeah. for any art, mm -hmm. engineering. Like the projects yeah. you did in class are not enough. Everybody did those class projects. Yeah, exactly. We live in a world today where, you know, all the all the game engines and software that you would need to make things is essentially free. Mm -hmm. Unity, Unreal, Blender, right. you know, all yeah. of this stuff is free. So right. you can't like there, there's no excuse not you don't like in the old days you maybe didn't have access to this stuff. Oh, I don't have a dev kit. You right. Know, or I, have, like, I had a crack Studio you know, Max is twenty thousand dollars. Exactly. Yeah. Nowadays, you have access to everything you need. So team up with your friends and make great head-turning games. That is mm -hmm. by far the most effective way to get a job. Like when we're interviewing people, and especially folks that don't have a you know a resume filled with game credit, you know, with Companies. game yeah. credits and major publishers. Great, just show me. If you're an artist, show me your portfolio. If you're a yeah. tech artist, show me your shaders. If you're an engineer, designer. And not just paper designs, like show me you worked with a team, you sat down with a team and made something great. You can go get, build yeah. a game, you know, sit down with your friends for a few months, build an amazing game, launch it on Steam, launch it into the App Store. Let me play mm -hmm. it during the interview, send it to me beforehand. That is by far the most effective way. When mm -hmm. you come into an interview and you're like, well, you know, here are the projects I did in school and sort of the, you know, when you're like, well, what else have you done? Or have you done this or that? They're sort of like a lot of folks will give you that sort of blank stare. They're like, but right, like, what do you so mean? my first job is for like sitting down and making a real game with a team. Like that's going to happen. Like you're going to help me do that. And it's like, well, yeah. maybe, but there's a lot of people vying for those entry level roles. And if you want to differentiate, like sit down mm -hmm. and make great things, like show us what you can do. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's always like, yeah. Artists, like I say, like have a art station, Right, like they have your stuff up there, you can see, and designers have a website where you can see and they have playable levels and links to the games and stuff like that. A resume alone is not enough, you know. That's, I mean, that, that the way I landed my job at LucasArts was with my, my reel, like it was, you mm. know, back on a VHS tape. But there you go, like, right, you know, yep. here's all the work that I did, and it wasn't, you know, there were probably a couple of class pro like projects in there, but again, I was an engineer, so the art, the animation was mostly things I did for fun. Yeah, which is impressive, right? Because it, it, you know, engineer art is always a joke, right? Like it's like, well, I'll just get something in there. So the fact that you're able to do something that looked that good and you had the engineering chops, yeah, that's a testament. I quickly realized that I was that like I was sort of hitting right. the peak of what I was able to achieve, and additional work <laughs> and investment was not going to get me to the point of like some of the right. greatness that you and I know. Hey, but let's yeah, focus look, on also, my skills. Yeah, yeah but skills. if you're at the intersection of both, right? If you're an artist who knows enough technology, or you're a mm -hmm. You're an engineer with enough art skill to like create things that aren't just boxes. Yeah. That also opens up interesting opportunities because mm -hmm. I mean, Definitely. in my experience, the most fun jobs in the industry are at that intersection of art and engineering. Mm -hmm. Tech art, you know, I've worked lots of jobs in the games business from management, right. project management, art, engineering. By far the most fun jobs are tech art. And in demand, right? Like everyone is looking for tech artists, and tech artists are always just high demand right to, to get people that can do both of those things and depending what side of the scale you're on art with a little bit of engineering or heavy engineering with a little bit of art um it's job security and interesting exciting stuff I mean, and it was cool like if i think about if i think about my career like the work i was doing at direct x sure it was super engineering heavy but understanding mm -hmm. from an art perspective like at the end of the day mm -hmm. all the engineering like direct x graphics all the engineering that goes into graphics systems and games yeah. It's never an end into and of itself. It's the game is a viewer for content. As an engineer, right. all you're doing is you're creating an engine that allows artists to create amazing looking things. 
Mm -hmm. So knowing what the artists want to achieve and more or less how they build it is super important to creating, you know, to somebody who's creating a, a game platform. No, that makes a lot of sense. So thinking back, you know, when you're an engineer, like what's your advice for advancing uh, a career as an engineer? In the games industry, look, there are a few things. One is the fundamentals are actually kind of important. There are a lot of yeah. game programs that are kind of like churning folks out that have mm -hmm. like sort of do basic programming in Unity, but right. have like that kind of underlying what's going on under the hood computer science yep. stuff, which is fine in the short term. But what ends up happening is when you have to switch engines or you have to switch architectures, like you go from, you know, PC to mobile, or you want to go from console, you know, you're, you're switching yeah, it, between, yeah. you know, from un Unity to Unreal. And right. you want to really be able to like, not just use the engine, but thrive in it and push it to its limits. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand what's going on under the hood, you're at a huge disadvantage. Yes. Um, so I think that's a big thing. Another big thing is don't be dogmatic. We mm -hmm. see a lot of engineers that are like, you know, especially coming out of college, like, oh yeah, you know, Unity all the way, or you know, right. Unreal all the way, or I'm all, you know, Nvidia. Like it's weird, you know. Yeah. Picking languages, you know, with like these weird loyalties, like stop that. Right. It's just, it's just, it's not professional. And it, it, at mm -hmm. worst, sorry, at best, it's not professional. And at worst, it's career limiting. Yeah. Like as an engineer, yep. you've got to just be, you know, equal opportunity. Whatever tool gets the job done, we're going to get it done. And mm -hmm. you don't know where the tides of business will flow. Right. And so, you know, just because there's a great engine or a tool or a company you love, someone makes a bad business decision. And all of a sudden that tool is not really available or isn't devolving anymore. And if you're yeah. stuck to it, you're behind. So right. as a, as an engineer, it's like, understand the fundamentals and don't be loyal to, you know, any one language, like learn, you know, learn a bunch, learn a bunch of different mm -hmm. tools, learn different platforms, learn different engines. That's yeah. going to be your greatest advantage. Yeah. And you're right too. These schools are churning out people and they can poke unity to do stuff, but by not having that understanding underneath, they don't know what they're doing. So then it creates like whack-a-mole so when there's like bugs. It's like they, they fix one and they make two because they, yeah. they don't have that underneath. And it's just maddening to be on the other end of that. We're just like, why can we can finish this project? Because they don't know what they're doing. They're just poking the box and make stuff coming out, but they don't understand the layers underneath that or have the computer science degree. And they it just creates tech debt and headaches for everyone. So... Yeah, they don't. I mean, you've you've been a producer, right? It's like you yeah, have, yeah. don't have a good architectural sense. That means things get sloppy. You don't really notice until things start breaking, right? Um, right. And then on the other side, there's things that the artists and designers want to be able to achieve that become mm -hmm. impossible if the en if the engine doesn't sort of do it natively. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got to make the engine you know contort a little bit if you're limited in your engineering skills, or if you've right. only worked in one engine and only know how to do it that engine's way. You know, yeah. you're, it's just going to be limiting for you and your team. Right. Now I think about it too, like, you know, you and I worked in Gastro X, right? And and like you came up with the the fluid dynamics <laughs> and the soft body tissue, right? And people were like, is that a fluid well, It wasn't just is me. that going to work? We, we had some talented works. artists and yeah. engineers on that. But that's a, that's a great example, right? Unity yeah. doesn't support real-time, you know, flowing, mixing fluids of, you know, blood and water interacting right. with Fishy, soft tissue environment. You can't do any of that in Unity, right? right? We still in 2017 on an iPhone seven, right? Like that's it's an iPhone five S, five S. Okay, yeah, it's an iPhone five S. Yeah, and right. Yeah, I mean, you, none of those engines will do that. Even today, the engines won't do that out of the box, right? But you know, if you go in there and you're like, "Look, we understand what the hardware can do. We understand the limitations of the engine. Let's drill through it and make this happen." And mm -hmm. you know, the next thing you know, we're up on stage at SIGGRAPH. Uh, yep. you know, get <laughs> like getting to second with, place and beating out yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, and applause. Epic. Right, exactly. It was epic. And video, everyone was up there. They're like, no, we love the squishy tissues and the blood on the phone thing. <laughs> and so, right. yeah, I mean, I think that that really like, you know, you can really achieve groundbreaking things. But the reason is because we had people working on it that really like understood the fundamentals of computer graphics and yeah. weren't just limited by what Unity supported out of the box. That would have been a pretty right. long game. If all we, if we were limited to what Unity supported out of the box, yeah, we had a rollout of our own on that, and um, it showed, and, and and that's what made it so unique. So yeah, don't be constrained by the engine. Figure out ways around things. So kind of shifting gears, like what do you feel is the most important quality or skill to have in your current role as a CEO? Right. So 
your management now. You're not engineering. Like, how do you make that transition? All that kind of stuff. What's what's it like to be a good CEO? I have the way I do it, which is not necessarily like there. There are many ways. Mm-hmm. There are many successful CEO. Like people like to try to distill down. Like, you know, there's all the clickbait. Yeah. What do all CEOs have in common? <laughs> the yeah. answer, the real answer, very little. Mm-hmm. People have very very different approaches to things, and yeah. so I don't like. Again, getting back to the theme of not being dogmatic, I'm not going to be like, there's, you know, the right way to do it is. Right. The chosen path. Okay. There are a couple of skills, though, I think that are fairly, you know, like having empathy is going to, you know, make you successful in any role in the games industry as a CEO mm-hmm. is rather critical. Yeah. Uh, you know, you live in a world where like people can, you know, really work on anything if they want to. They, if they don't want to work on GastroX, they can go work on Call of Duty. Yeah. And so, you know, making sure that, you know, like empathy is crucial. Mm-hmm. Being able to, you know, not just deal with ambiguity, but be able to like really thrive in it is right. also really important, especially if you're doing the kind of things that we do, like genre creation. Right. Yeah, um, exactly. Building where it's genre. not rinse and repeat. It's like it has never been done before. Nobody right. has ever really made a game studio for doctors. Mm-hmm. So there's really no playbook. You've got to right. figure it out as you go. Right. There are like, in, on my, in my case, certain things I do, but it's not a prerequisite. Like I'm big into like sort of the leading by example. And mm-hmm. like I take my, for me, it's like I take a vested interest in like what every one of the company is doing. Like yeah. there are CEOs where they're like, oh, marketing, I don't get marketing. You know, oh, engineering, poof. You know, those nerds in the basement, like right, yeah, figure it out, good luck. Someone right? else will talk to them. Right. Yeah. And so for me, as no, I'm like, I'm int- like, I'm, I'm d- deeply fascinated like just curious, mm-hmm. like I'm, I'm fascinated, not because it's in my best interest as CEO, but just in terms of like how I am as a human, I'm fascinated right. by what the artists are doing and what the game designers are doing and how the marketers are thinking and what are the engineering problems we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. That might be like, but I also have this weird background where like I've worked as an artist and engineer and everything like that's not required. There are plenty yeah. of CEOs that are very successful and, you know, can't write a line of code and you know, have never opened Maya. Yeah. And to your point, yeah, there's all, there's all different flavors, you know, I think of Patrick Curry and Farbridge and success he's having and, you know, coming from game design and stuff like that. And well, he also, Patrick also you know, has a strong engineering background, right? And I don't, yeah, he has his engineering background. Yeah. And design. So it was like engineering and design. And then he, you know, started Farbridge and all that, those kind of things. And, but, you know, that growth mindset and just like wanting to figure things out and not freaking out when there's not a playbook, right? Or not like, well, this is how you got to do it all the time because it doesn't always work or there isn't there isn't a book on it. So, yeah. yeah. And also for folks like, you know, Patrick Curry or, you know, Dave Lang, like having a, you know, yeah, Dave. impressive stature is also helpful. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. I am average height. <laughs> yeah, both I, those guys I do not have that to my advantage. Yeah. Lang's probably pushing 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, He's a big dude. Yeah, that's funny. What about your advice for developing interpersonal skills, EQ core skills, as they call it? I mean, touch on that a little bit around empathy, but. I fundamentally believe, and I know like empathy is, it shouldn't be like a cop-out answer, but like, mm-hmm. even if you think about it from like anyone's perspective, right? Like how, how do you translate empathy for somebody who like isn't intuitively empathetic? Let's say like, you know, the like nerdy, you know, the stereotypical introverted right. engineer. Yeah. I mean, there I would treat, you know, I would turn empathy into an exercise in sort of curiosity and research and understanding, right? Like if you're not going to empathize with the person because like you feel a connection to them as a human, like empathize with the person because you're trying to understand what makes them tick. Yeah. And if you view it that way, all right, this person's saying something, it's upsetting. I don't like this. Okay. Take a step back. Just like any engineering problem you're dealing with. All right, let's, let's work the problem. Okay, right. let's try to understand it from their perspective, right? Let's try to view it from a, to take it from a different angle. Why mm-hmm. could they be saying this? Why would they be acting this way? All right, now mm-hmm. let's look at the problem, assuming positive intent. You know, these are the kinds of things like you'd almost break it down. Like, all right, how do you solve yeah. an engineering problem? I have a bug, right? How do I debug this? Well, yeah. I got this tool and that tool, and I probably need to think. You know, eventually, if I've, you know, if I, if it's been an hour and I haven't figured it out, maybe I go for a walk. Maybe I take a different approach. Maybe I think about it differently. Mm -hmm. You know, great. All right. Same thing works with interpersonal relationships. Like, okay, let me try to understand what motivates this person. It's probably may not be, I shouldn't project myself. It may not be the same thing that motivates me, Mm -hmm. you know, and understand like, and then eventually you start getting, as as that skill develops, you start getting into sort of next level, you know, you really start 
you know, understanding like not just, you know, all right, why is somebody saying something, but like fundamentally what motivates people, what wakes yeah. them up in the morning, you know, understanding that like also, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Like everyone's fighting their own battles you don't see. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And you will not know those things, but just knowing that they're fighting them can often be helpful, mm -hmm. you know, in yeah. dealing with everything from interpersonal conflict to just trying to get a team to work more effectively together. Yeah, no, those are great points. What's been one or two of your favorite games or projects to work on? You know what? I'm going to say, I'm going to like, let's pick, we'll do Jedi Starfighter because that's like my first game. Yeah. And it was right. just so much fun. And it was, mm -hmm. we were there like, we were, on, you know, literally going to the ranch every few weeks. It was between yeah. episode one and episode two. We were getting concept art in from the movie, and I was just like, "There's no uh, way they're gonna pull this off in film." And then they did, and it was just, it was just fantastic. Cool. It was a lot of fun. And then maybe on the other side, let's go to Gastro X. Yeah, I mean, Gastro X was cool because that was, you know, we really we ran the hardware hot. We really showed yes. what was possible <laughs> on iPhone five. Like we surprised Apple. Yeah, uh, yeah I remember definitely. we just dug through. We built these like crazy Unity plugins. To like, because you know, didn't have access to certain operating system APIs that I knew were there from my direct X days. So literally it was uh, like taking the things that like I had standardized and my team had standardized and developed in direct X. And mm -hmm. here we were, let's see, it was probably like 10 years later almost. And yeah, so 16, that technology had yeah. made its way into a generation or two of consoles. And now finally was coming into 10 years later, making its way into a phone Mm -hmm. And then we could be like, all right, great. Let's take advantage of this. There are crazy things we know we can do with it. Let's do it. And that's where all the like crazy, it looked like we gutted the renderer. Like everything was, yeah. the game was just like, it didn't even use Unity's renderer. It was like its own thing mm -hmm. <laughs> with all the like, again, the squishy tissues and the fluids and the blood and the cutting and everything it looked amazing. And it was yeah. fun. Like all yeah. of that physics led to really interesting emergent gameplay where like polyps would hide under fluids and, you know, there were yeah. different ways that you could like solve the puzzle. And, you know, there were all sorts of different things could, you know, hide in different ways and could cause complex bleeds that were really difficult to manage at that angle or given where you were. It was just ended up being really interesting. And so, you know, and yeah. I was almost felt that was kind of like a culmination of, you remember we used like hardware tessellation techniques and we used all sorts of things that I had mm -hmm. like played around at, at LucasArts and, you know, really like develops at Microsoft. And, and I remember we were just struggling so much with like the wire and removing polyps and like, you know, how simulation do you get it? And, you know, getting that imprint and everyone was taking shots at making it look right with everybody on, on the engineering side. And yeah, there was, it was really challenging, but the output, you know, was amazing, right? Like when we, once we, got it figured out yeah, i think it's also a perfect example of like why simulation is not the end all be all we built a bunch of simulation features that we ended up pulling out because they weren't fun right i yeah. remember like there was this whole thing where uh like in the game you know we were we, we would talk to gastroenterologists you know to figure out how to make this game fun and challenging we say all right look what's hard about your job like we'll talk to us and they gave us a bunch of examples and one of them was one of the way things we asked was like okay what differentiates an expert and a novice they said well actually the colon, when you're doing a colonoscopy, is like a deflated balloon. And yep. so if you're an expert, you can navigate it pretty easily. And if you're not an expert, what you have to do is you have to constantly, like there's a CO2 channel in the in the endoscope, you have to constantly inflate the colon in order to see where you're going if you don't right. know what you're doing. And that causes a lot of discomfort for the patient, as you can imagine. Yeah. And so one of the ways you can tell is like how much cable they have to insert because the more you, ah, insert, right. means you have to inflate more. And so we're like, oh, this sounds cool. We're going to go make a whole, like we built a whole inflation deflation system where it's easier to navigate if it's inflated, but you right. set it up. I remember we built this whole thing and yep. then we started having gastroenterologists play it and they were like, and we were like, yeah, what do you like the inflation? Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. And we're like, wait, what? And they were like, we were like, you told us that's challenging. And they're like, well, it's challenging for a resident. It's challenging for a noob, but once right. you've been doing gastroenterology for a year or two, you got the hang of that. That's the boring part. The exciting right, part boring, is dealing right. with the bleed. Just take me to the action. And you're like, yep. What? What? Like, yeah, I remember doing all that work. You're like, this is boring. Yeah, yeah. I remember I presented that system at I3D and all the graphics devs in the audience were like, this is so cool. We're like, that right. yeah, didn't make for good gameplay. We cut it. Yeah, was that was that Montreal I3D? I think so. I think we went up to, yeah, yeah that was, yeah, that was, was like one of the Ubisoft studios. Yeah, yeah. You and I and Thu went up for that one. That was, that was uh, a lot of fun. Yeah, it's like it's 2017. Yeah, and you get to learn a lot about uh, colonoscopies, as is always valuable in life later. As someone is hey, everybody needs a so, hobby. 
yeah, I uh, got to find out about stuff later became helpful in real life. So, so what are you curious about right now in the game industry? What am I curious about? Yeah. I'm playing around a lot with AI, with generative AI. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, we're playing around with it a lot at Level X, using it for different things. As you've sort of seen, I have a bunch of side projects where like, I'm testing out different things. Using, I'm playing a lot with ChatGPT, with MidJourney, with all sorts of different things, using it for... I, mean, I think you even saw, you know, we've been using it for solving interesting graphics and physics problems, mm-hmm. like problems that, you know, I figured would take us like six months to solve. Like I sit down with ChatGPT for a weekend or two and like get it, get it up and running, including stuff that involves like really complex math and really sort of multidisciplinary stuff. So, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of folks are looking at, you know, generative AI as like, oh, it's going to, oh no, it's like, it's going to replace the, you know, the like low level engineers, the work, the grunt work that you used to outsource. Mm-hmm. Now AI is going to do that. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. May, you know, I don't think, I think that's less interesting. I think what's interesting is how much it empowers the top decile engineers yeah. because a talented engineer teamed up with ChatGPT is, you know, orders of magnitude more effective. And this opens up to all sorts of, I think, interesting problems that mm-hmm. you'd struggle to solve before. Even a yep. you know strong engineer now it just you know crossing over languages and systems is no longer a limitation. You need yeah. complex math. It's got Mathematica plugged in. Like there's all sorts of interesting problems that we used to struggle to solve that are now more approachable. Yeah, it is exciting to see that. And I know in our Slack channel there's always stuff going on around ChatGPT and try this out and check this thing out and stuff. So yeah, don't be afraid of it. You, you know you have to embrace it and figure out. You know how to use it, but um, I feel that's sort of how the games industry has operated. I, I talk about this a lot, actually, in healthcare because healthcare mm-hmm. is, for good reason, very apprehensive about Gen AI. And I said, right. actually, the model you want to look at, like our whole theme at Level X, is hey, healthcare. The games industry has solved a lot of these problems already, and they've done a much mm-hmm. better job than anyone in healthcare. So bring this over. And right. I think Gen AI is another example where the video games industry is a great exemplar. Because we've been fearlessly adopting or, you know, fearlessly embracing Gen AI. Why is that? Because that's that's just what we do. Like yeah. every five years, your new console supports an order of magnitude more content with an order of magnitude more detail than the last mm-hmm. gen console. But your team size is basically the same. So mm-hmm. somehow your artist has to become an order of magnitude more productive. You're not going to like... No artist in the games industry expects to be doing the same thing they were doing five years ago. Whatever I was doing five years ago should be automated and I'm moving up, right? I'm no longer doing poly modeling. I'm like, you know, now we're in ZBrush. You know, Mm -hmm. we're no longer painting pixels. We're, you know, substance designing, you know, Mm -hmm. just dropping on materials. Like it's, you move up the stack. We're using procedural tools to generate cities. So Gen AI just becomes at least in the short term, just the next step in that evolution that we know and love in the games industry of like accelerating returns where just every generation, you're going to have mm-hmm. to completely rethink the way you build things. What potential threats do you see in the industry or concerns, would you say? It's a good question. You know, the games industry does have a track record of hurting itself, mining itself. It's done this yeah. on a few occasions. Like a few of the games industry crashes were in some ways you could look at it at least in hindsight, and realized some of that was self-inflicted. Um, yeah. I remember like the crash of movie-based games, right? Like they were amazing movie-based games in the 80s and 90s. Um, and then all of a sudden, once the publishers realized that the Metacritic score didn't correlate to the sales performance of the game. Right, right, right. It correlated Shit in the box, the right? That was, you know, was yeah, exactly. Like, all right, matter. throw six hours of gameplay in here and let it suck. It doesn't matter. And right. then it only took about a year or two for the market to wisen up and just realize it doesn't matter how excited you are about the movie, the game's mm-hmm. going to suck. Yeah, and yeah. it took at least a decade. I actually think Free to Play did a decent job of helping this out because Free to Play mm-hmm. games only make money if they're good um, yeah. or if they're fun. And so now they sort of created a little bit of resurgence in IP-based games that were good. And now yeah. we're seeing, you know, with like some amazing Harry Potter titles and other things that like we've, we've kind of fixed that, but there was a really sort of a lost decade at least in there. And I look yeah. at things like today, like the collapse of E3, the fact that we lack in the games industry, some of the like pomp and circumstance of like, you know, the mm-hmm. Emmys or the, the Oscars that like we don't publicly celebrate our art form I think right. is one of the reasons why we're stigmatized and one of the reasons we're not taken seriously, despite the fact that we're so much larger than mm-hmm. the music and movie industries. 
So what are your thoughts on, you know, AR, VR, XR, stuff like that? So look, I'm on several industry advisory boards for major hardware mm-hmm. vendors. I'm very excited about the future of VR, right? If you look mm-hmm. at, you know, a lot like my job in DirectX was basically like predict the future, you know, look at what are the semiconductor curves, you know, when are we going to have what capability when, and what is that going to translate to in terms of the kinds of experiences we can deliver for players, When I look at the trends, you know, the semiconductor trends, the material science trends, like the the optics trends that we're seeing with uh, AR and VR, it's not going to be very long until you have, you know, a lightweight, call it glasses-like thing you can put on your head Mm -hmm. and, or really just on the brim of your nose and get a compelling, you know, mixed reality or immersive reality experience. Yep. Uh, so I think that's like, as a developer and a gamer, I'm just thrilled about that. And I can't wait. And even in like, we're, you know, making games for doctors. So in healthcare, yeah. there are plenty of compelling examples for using it. In fact, we do the chat and we've made some actually really, we have like a version of gastro that runs in VR. And but more importantly, we've created like intubation games and other games in VR, uh, like radiation oncology games, like games where you really need that 3D spatial in order mm-hmm. to see things, in order to position yourself correctly relative to the patient, in order to see things you otherwise would be able to see or know where they are. Like yeah. VR can create things that are, can give you some real advantage. But today it's just, it's still not quite there. Yeah. And, you know, we see a, like a lot of, I think there was a little bit of overhype. Even on Palmer Lucky and company were saying things like oh, there's too right, much yeah. money being thrown at, VR content. Like you guys are not going to make a return on this investment. Right. And I think in the in the healthcare space, we saw nonstop examples of badly implemented VR, like yep. not following any of the best practices we've established in the games industry, creating a lot of nausea and bad experiences that gave people a bad first taste. Um, right. VR. Just tainted it for them. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like level X, like we've got, you know, three million people playing our games on mobile, a million medical professionals. We've had probably 70 or 80,000 play our mobile AR experiences, like on your phone, AR kit, AR core. We've had mm-hmm. about seven or 8,000 play our headset experiences and, you know, Oculus and HTC Vive and Magically and, 2. And Magically knows. 1 and 2. Yeah. Which yeah. is great. I mean, that's for healthcare, that's huge numbers, but it's yeah. still two orders of magnitude smaller. So right. I'm just really excited about the day when it just becomes a pair of glasses. You can put it on, take it off. It's available in the operating room. It's available while you walk down the street. It's available in your workplace, and mm-hmm. I, you know, in your you throw it on your living room. And there's going to be great experiences, and we're starting to see some of them, of course, come out of the games industry. But it just feels yeah. early. The, you know the the rush where everyone was like, "Oh, it's the next gold rush." So I, I think you had that story about what was it like 2015, 2016, 17? Everyone's making games in VR, thinking they were going to be billionaires and it was like i think you were at a conference it was like you know who who here is making games for vr and a bunch of people raised their hands and like who's making money with it yeah not many, not many hands were still up right you know so uh, well, yeah, i remember like 2016 2015 like we had pressure from some of our investors at the time who were like you've got to pivot this you've got to reestablish level x as a vr company it's like guys right. no I yeah. just don't think like for healthcare, like I just don't think the timing is right. I don't think it provides a lot of now we had a horse in the race. Like we were making some VR content, but I was like, Yeah, do I'm this. Sorry. We'll mobile first and we'll bring some of it over to VR where it's appropriate, where it's appropriate. Right. We'll do mobile AR VR. And they were like, No, Sam, come on, you're missing the boat here. Level X mm. is gonna be behind. I was like, guys, you gotta do what's right, right from the doctors, you know, right. sit tight. And I remember like six or nine months later, I was in a board meeting and somebody like one of the board members was like, whoa, we dodged that VR VR bullet. And I was like, what? <laughs> we? <laughs> yeah. Oh, whatever. You know, it, yeah. look, it's very, very difficult to predict this stuff. And yeah. I, I still fundamentally believe in the technology. And at Level X, we've done great things with it. And we will mm-hmm. continue to do great things with it. You know, everything in its right place and right time. We say like there's there's so much that healthcare can learn and benefit from the video games industry before you strap a brick to your head. But if you're <laughs> going to strap a brick to your head, just make sure you do it right. Yeah, exactly. And everyone's got mobile in their pocket, right? So like you have to hit the uh, the common denominator and then look for other avenues. But um, but yeah. so, look, and soon everyone will have a VR AR headset. And when that day comes, that right. will be awesome across the board. Yeah, definitely. So what's a funny or odd story from working in the industry because I know you got a bunch. Yeah, I mean, there's so many. I think there's so many from the video games industry. I'm thinking like, all right, so yeah, (laughs) this is a story about 
what happens when video game developers discover the state of the art in medical training? Because mm -hmm. we're, you know, as muggles, we think about, oh, doctors, like whew, before this doctor does surgery on me, the training must be crazy. They must have like all sorts of, you know, complex like VR uh -huh. future. It's got to be like the holodeck because it's doctors. <laughs> and then you discover how they actually learn. Right. And it's always humbling. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I remember like, you know, we're a team of video game developers and one of the ways that, you know, at Level X, you bring a team of video game developers up to speed on a new specialty, anesthesia, gastroenterology, cardiology, is we grab a cohort and we take them to the conference. Just like if you want to ramp someone up on the games industry, you bring them to GDC. You see. Yep. So you want to ramp up a team of game developers, you take them to D the gastroenterology conference, DDW. And luckily, we're based in Chicago. So the conferences mostly come to us. Yeah. And so D digestive disease week for, digestive. for people out there. For right. people, yeah, they're not in the know. Right. For everyone who's like, DDW, where do I sign up? Right. Yeah. My first one ever. I was like, wow, this is big. Yeah. It's McCormick, McCormick place. place. So, yeah. yeah so we, we're, okay. So we're sending a team of game developers to DDW to learn about what are the interesting challenges in gastroenterology. And before we go, one of the gastroenterologists we've been working with is like, look, guys, if you go to DDW and you're making a gastroenterology game, you've got to feature the argon plasma coagulator. But it's a plasma. It's literally a plasma rifle. It's super tiny. Yep. But it's a plasma rifle and it uses superheated plasma to seal bleeds like when you're doing endoscopic surgery. So like you're in your meter inside the body, you know, doing surgery through a camera and you need to you know, zap a bleed. You use your little uh, plasma rifle. Yep. It looks super cool. It's a lightning gun. It's like looks like yeah. force. It's awesome. It's got a pedal so, on it too. So, and so stuff, the, right? Yeah. So Gas was like, look, you got you guys have got to check it out. They'll have a bunch of them on the floor. So Andy, one of our developers, like starts yeah. running around the show floor to try to find an argon plasma coagulator. And he, he finds one. Um, but what's even more impressive than the APC is the simulator that they're using to demo it. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> like historically at level X, we've seen med medical simulators are terrible. You know, or like the right. stick serious games, they all look like crappy games out of the 90s. Like right, it's all right. 64 graphics. Half-Life or something. Yeah. It's terrible. But the simulator that he was using to demo the APC in this booth was amazing. So basically, mm -hmm. it's like there's a TV, you know, there's a screen. And then there's like, it looked like a, uh, it looked like a PlayStation. Yeah. Um, except the controller wasn't a PlayStation controller. It was the actual colonoscope, right? right. The, the guy, the sales rep was like moving. And as he moved it on the screen, you see like the most realistic simulation you've ever seen. There's no blood because blood is really hard to simulate, but like the tissue moved realistically. The lighting looked great. When he cauterized, like when he fired the plasma rifle, you could see the smoke and the smoke like billowed, you know, like with vorticity. And yeah. so Andy's like blown away. He's like, oh my God, this is like the best simulator we've ever seen in healthcare. Like what engine is this? Is this unity? Is it unreal? Like, what is it? Right. And so he's bombarding this guy with questions, but the poor guy's a sales rep. He can't answer any of it. So he pulls over an engineer from the, like from his team who built yeah. the actual device and like Andy's bombarding him with questions. What's in there? Is it NVIDIA, you know, AMD, like what's the hardware, OpenGL, yeah. DirectX? What? And like, they're talking over each other for about two or three minutes until finally the company rep goes, wait a minute, you do realize it's a pig in the box, right? <laughs> and Andy's like, what are you talking about? He goes, the day before the show, we take a slaughtered pig, we cut out its intestines and we sew it into the inside of this box. There's no chips in there. Like there's right. a pig intestine in there. And it's only good for, we have to do it every three days because after that, it starts to smell. You're a video a pig, <laughs> right? Like we've solved these problems in video games, what, a decade ago? And there's a pig in the box. <laughs> right. Now at Level X, we have, a lot, we have lots of these stories and they all follow the same arc. Right. Where you mm -hmm. have the like, there's the ha ha moment of like, ha ha, I can't believe there's a pig in the box. That's right. hilarious, which is right. followed by this like immediate moment of like this pit in your stomach when right. you go, oh, wait a minute. That's an that's argon plasma coagulator. You use that to you because you've been doing endoscopic surgery. You accidentally nick a blood vessel. The patient starts gushing blood inside their body. You've got to seal it real quick. Yep. The dead pig intestines don't bleed. Which mm -hmm. means the first time a surgeon ever uses this on a real bleed, it's going to be inside a live human being. Right. And that's the moment when the game developer goes from, ha ha ha, oh. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait a that's minute. That's scary.
Yes. Yeah. Wait. Oh, this game I'm making is actually going to be really important. Yes. And so we have we have lots of stories that like continuously just sort of follow this arc of like, oh my god, I can't believe they do it that way. Wait, what? They oh oh, like my my grandmother's going in for that surgery. You know, right. and, it's like, and it's not and it's not because it's not the doctor's fault. It's not because doctors are luddites. It's not because doctors are backwards. It's because the only mm -hmm. tool we give them to train is the dead pig in a box. Yeah. And then it's up to them. And so, right. you know, that's why they're hesitant to try new things because like, all right, who are the patients I'm going to practice this on? Yeah. That's wild to think about all that stuff. So what uh, game or games are you playing now that you're excited about? Is there anything currently? I'm there? playing a lot of casual and hyper casual stuff lately. Yeah, um, makes sense. I've been really, I really, I love physics puzzles. Mm -hmm. Um, so like, I'm a big fan of like, feed me oil. Where's my water and frost? Where's my water? I yeah. most, I mostly end up playing on mobile just cause like, that's where, you know, I have time and we make games for mobile. So, yeah. um, lately I've been playing like the, like those 3d match three games where like, mm -hmm. there's like piles of 3d objects that you've got to match. And I'm actually like, they're a lot of fun. And I'm actually like realizing as I play them that there are a lot of like visualization skills that I'm developing as I play. So mm -hmm. stay tuned. I think there are going to be some interesting applications of this stuff in healthcare. And the production values are, are really nice too, right? I mean, it's not just hacked together. Like they're, they're no, really they're well fun, done. They're rewarding. They're polished. Yeah. So, so how can we pull that into healthcare, right? And do things like that. Yeah, that's cool. Is there anything I should have asked you about, but didn't? Um, I mean, you're over in, you're over in Europe. If you want to talk a little bit about that. Oh, yeah. I mean, last week was a week and a half ago. I was out in Kiev uh, mm -hmm. in Ukraine, which is quite a little tricky to get to because yeah. the airspace is closed. So you have to take like a 12 hour train from Poland. Um, I can't talk about it in too much detail, but I think we've, we've already announced like so we, yeah. we starting with some stuff we did with some conversations we had with NATO. Now we're working with the Ukrainian armed forces on the medical side. So we're meeting with Stratcom and some of their medical leadership to basically figure out, you know, like they're dealing with some serious problems uh, on the front line in terms right. of just medical training and preparedness. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the sort of NATO guidelines for you know medical treatment for combat casualty care, like they're really sort of stretching the limits of those guidelines because of the scenarios that they're dealing with. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're finding ways to use video game technology to help provide training to you know folks that are thrown in the field and you know have to do medical training with little to no medical background yeah because they're just on the front lines and they don't have that background so yeah the, um, the, what, the ukrainians yeah. have had to improvise quite a bit but also while i was there was great i got to meet with some you know some uh ukrainian video game companies there's incredible talent there i mean i've been working my last company mm -hmm. did video games for hollywood movies we worked yeah. with multiple ukrainian studios on uh, things like hidden object games and whatnot there's just phenomenal talent in kiev and everywhere so yeah. it was great to also meet with them. And I'd encourage my colleagues in the video games industry, like go continue to support. So first off, continue to support Ukrainian studios. Yep. Um, and in as much, you know, don't be afraid to go. And if anyone is curious, like I'm happy to give them travel advice and, you know, talk them through how to do it. I felt safe mm -hmm. all the time. You know, there are like air raid sirens go off, but you know, for yep. the most part, like I think they do a great job of maintaining normalcy and the Ukrainian developers are continuing to deliver. That's exciting. And uh, what was it like doing the uh, the NATO presentation too? Because that was a little bit. Ago. Oh, and Lillehammer. Yeah. No, it's, I mean it's, it was fascinating. I mean, look, the, in the video games industry, we don't realize what we're sitting on. Like the technologies mm -hmm. that have been created to make great games, make realistic characters, help people solve puzzles. Like all yeah. of these technologies are highly, highly relevant to any scenario where you need to help somebody develop a mental model of a complex system. Yeah. Totally. You know, all these examples, you know, it's like Angry Birds is teaching you parabolic flight. Tens of millions of Americans can name 40 Pokemon characters, can't show you where Switzerland is on the map. It's because right. games are very good at educating as an indirect consequence of play. And so mm -hmm. if you, you know, adjust things a little bit, you've got to keep the fun. The fun is how you make it effective. Yep. Uh, you keep the fun and you just adjust, right? Okay, now this reductive reasoning puzzle is going to teach you how to diagnose a difficult patient. Um, mm -hmm. All right, this strategy game is now going to teach you how to manage a patient with multiple comorbidities. You know, oh, this physics puzzle mechanic, we're going to use this to treat, teach you how to do this, this tricky endoscopic maneuver. And so yeah. 
you can utilize not just the tech, the tech is obvious, right? Like, oh, great, better graphics. Right. But what's more interesting is the neuroscience behind the game design. Mm -hmm. uh, we're sitting on this in games and at level X, we're unleashing it in healthcare to great success, but there's lots of other places that you could be, that the games industry can be deploying this. And, right. you know, I, I fundamentally believe like the video games industry just broke 200 billion a year in revenue. And, you know, okay, where's the next 100 billion going to come from? We continue to grow the industry. It's not going right. to come from, you know, NFT, Web3, <laughs> crypto crap. But I think no. it will come from new genres like professional games. You know, we now have everybody in the workforce has grown up on video games. So I think there's, you know, and there's a lot of vested interest in continuing to train people. I think there's a mm -hmm. lot of opportunity to create, you know, I think what Level X is doing is we've created this genre of medical games, but I fundamentally believe that that's going to be a subgenre of pro games, of professional games. And so I think that, you know, the industry is just sort of is sitting on this and it's a massive growth opportunity. And they've grown up, you know, to your point, like I remember sitting in focus tests with Gastro X and they're like, oh, this is awesome. And I already play games on my phone, you, you know, so they just pick it up and they're very intuitive. And it was like, Sometimes it was GI doctors, sometimes it was residents, but like that leap isn't weird. It isn't like, oh, that's video games and taboo and only goofballs, right? Like it, it's just part of their life. So making that transition with that experience in games into medical makes sense. And it just feels natural. It's not quirky or weird. Oh, know? definitely. And even the ones that are like skeptical of the concept, they're like, wait, you know, games yeah. for doctors. You go, well, then you say, oh, well, you know, are you a gamer? They go, no, 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 I'm not a gamer. Do you play games? No, 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 I don't play games. Do you play Candy Crush? Well, yeah, I play Candy Crush. You play Wordle? Well, yeah, I play Wordle. Yeah, cross. What about yeah. Angry Birds? Well, fine, I play Angry Birds, but I'm not a, you know, it's like, oh, you're playing. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, Just yeah. like, you know, are you a movie goer? You know, yeah, yeah, I don't know people how people associate, but like, all right, you know, your people are playing. Everybody's playing. Yeah. So it's a natural extension of all that. So where can people find you online, you know, websites, socials, stuff like that? Levelx.com, levelex.com mm -hmm. is the company website. I'm the only Sam Glassenberg in the world. So you can find me on LinkedIn, <laughs> follow me on LinkedIn, just search Sam Glassenberg. Um, I think I have a, I have a blog at glassenberg.com. Does that cover most of the major ones? Sam ZG on Twitter? Yeah. That, and yeah, that is crazy. You're the only one because there are, I thought I was the only John Podlasic and there are a couple. Last question, like what's one piece of advice you give others working in the industry right now? In the industry in general, embrace AI. Don't fear it. Yeah. Don't fear it. Embrace it. Just start playing with it. Yep. Um, it will make you, there is no role in the games industry that doesn't benefit from this. And the mm -hmm. folks that I fundamentally believe the folks that jump on it first are going to be at a major advantage. And so right. there's a lot of folks that are approaching it with trepidation and fear. That's understandable, but that is only going to do a disservice to you as an individual and put you at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And so whether you're a writer, an artist, a designer, an engineer, just jump on it and start using it. And if you're not using it for work, maybe your work doesn't let you use it for yep. personal stuff. Just start using it. And very, very quickly, you're going to realize it's like, and the best analogy I could give you is, you know, for all of those folks in the industry that have been waiting for years to become a lead or a manager, yeah, um, to, you know, to be able to scale their effectiveness by having a team under them, everyone out of college now has an intern, yeah, right? Free right. intern who will work endless hours, has access to the breadth of human knowledge, is an expert engineer, artist, da, 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 yeah. and just needs proper direction to help you do whatever you want to do. That is incredibly empowering. But if you're going to fear it, then the folks that do embrace it are going to surpass you. Right. And they're going to be miles ahead of you by the time you finally begrudgingly embrace it and you're back at noob level and they're like, you know, expert level. Right. Yeah, they're already I, speaking I a all different language. Yeah. No, it's just like once you start using it, you know, every day I'm in there, I'm just like, we're going to get some better questions to interview for this type of role, you, you know, and I throw it in there and wow, that's a good one and tweak this or tweak that. But it's just such a great sounding board for ideas and getting information and asking questions. And yeah, it's, you got to embrace it. It's just silly not to. Well, cool. This has been awesome. Thank you so much, Sam, for doing this tonight. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me, JP. Keep up the good work. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you found it helpful and possibly inspiring for your game development journey. Uh, please leave comments down below. 
and like and subscribe just to help me with these YouTube algorithms. Plus, if you'd like some coaching help or just help support the show, go to the Patreon page down below. Thanks until the next one.